Hey what's up guys, welcome to Burning Guys Tech. In today's video we're going to show you guys how to install and how to configure DHCP on Windows Server 2019. Now for those of you that don't know what DHCP is, in the previous video of this series I did explain exactly what DHCP is. So feel free to go and watch that video first if you haven't done so already. So on to the agenda on this video. Today is going to be a short one, straightforward. We're just going to go ahead and install DHCP on Server 2019. And for those of you that don't know, this is going to be a role that we're going to install on Server 2019. We're going to give it a role to play. And in this case, the role is DHCP, which is to serve us with IP addresses. Then after we've installed the DHCP role, we're going to go ahead and configure that son of a gun. So on to the installation, guys. All right, my homies, here we are on my Windows Server 2019 virtual machine server. For those of you that's been following the series, this is the very same server that we've used in the previous episodes of this series. So today, we're going to go ahead and install the DHCP role and configure it after installation. So how do we add a role? You guys would know by now. We're going to go click here on add role there, or alternatively, you can go here to the top, top right hand side to manage. And you can go and click on the one that says add roles and features. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on that one there. Brings up the little wizard. So we're just going to go over all the defaults for now. So next, next, next. And obviously we are looking for what? DHCP. So there we go. Automatically gives you all the features that's um, probably going to be required to run all of that. So that's pretty, pretty nice of Microsoft to go and do. Let's just say add. Next, we don't need any additional features at this time, so we're just going to go next, next, and let's install that son of a gun. All right, guys, I'm going to do a quick time lapse here just to speed things on for you guys. I don't want to waste your time. A few moments later, and we're back. All right, so there was a bit of a time lapse there. We didn't want to waste your time. You can see the installation is now done, so I'm going to close that sucker. And believe it or not, guys, that actually is all there is to it when it comes to the installation side of things. Now, if you're going to go and install DHCP on a virtual machine or a physical server that you've got direct access to, that's pretty much it when it comes to the installation side of things. If you are going to want to try and do that on some form of remote server, perhaps, or anything else, then it gets a little bit more complex. I wouldn't say difficult. But for this one, for today, I want to actually go as far as to say it's easy peasy. So what's next is to go and configure that son of a gun. And as you can see now, top right hand side by the notification section, it shows us there's some sort of configuration that needs to take place now. So we're going to go click on that. And you'll notice now it says complete DHCP configuration. So now we're going to go ahead and actually configure the DHCP server. At this point in time, the role has been added, but that's it. It's not um, functional in any way whatsoever at this point in time yet. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. I'm going to go with mostly all the defaults for now. Next. That's fine for now. Commit. Close. And there we go. So what's next now is we're going to go to the DHCP console. With a lot of components that you go and add, there's normally a console for it. For example, with DNS, there's a console for DNS. There's a console for DHCP. Where you find these consoles, so to speak, is by going to the top right hand side to the tools menu. And there you'll find your DHCP along with other things like your DNS, etc, etc. So obviously today's topic is configuring DHCP. So we're not going to do DNS today yet. That's going to be a different video on its own. I'm going to go to DHCP. All right, let's expand that son of a gun. It's a little bit small. Here you go. So you can see my domain. That's as default as it gets. Let's expand that. I'll zoom in here for you guys just to make it a little bit easier to see. Now, I'm going to keep this as simple as possible. So I'm only going to work with IP version 4 today. Um, but keep in mind that you could possibly be working with IP version 6 as well, depending on your country and how many IPs you've got available and all that. So for now, let's expand IP version 4. 
and that's default default there's nothing going on here yet at this point in time so one of the first things you're going to want to go and do here is you are going to want to go and create yourself what we call a scope this can be done by right clicking on ip version 4 and there's an option here it says new scope and that's the one you're going to want to go and click on i'm going to click on that so scope in case you are wondering what the cheese this is this is effectively just the range from which IP up until which other IP am I going to be dishing out effectively? And how many IPs do I have available to dish out? So if you've got only 50 IP addresses that you want to dish out and you want to give out, let's say, for argument's sake, from 50 all the way to 100, then you're going to have to go and specify that here and now. So we'll see that in a moment. So let's go click on next. Give it a name. It doesn't really matter now. So I'm just going to say burning ice tech scope. Obviously, in a real company, in a real production environment, you're going to give it a proper name, not something silly like that. Next. Aha, there we go. So here you get to specify how many IPs you've got and from where they start and up until where they go. It does benefit you quite a lot if you know a little bit about IP addressing and even more so if you know a little bit about subnetting. So if you know about IP addresses and you know about subnetting, this is going to be a piece of cake for you. If you don't, it will be beneficial for you to go and do some research about that first. So in a nutshell, I'm going to start off with 192.168.0. I'm going to keep this as simple, simple as possible. Default class C, IP address private and all that. And for argument's sake, let's say I want to start from IP address 20. I'm not going to start from one because in most organizations, they like to reserve a few IP addresses for other things like servers and printers and that kinds of jazz. So it could actually be any IP addresses you can go and reserve, but I've seen in most organizations, they like to reserve the first few IP addresses, like number one, number two, number three, those ones. So I'm only going to start from dot .20 here. So starting from dot .20, how many IPs do I want? So if I want, let's say roughly about 50, I'm going to go from 192.168.0 from 20 all the way to about give or take 70. You can see that's a triple two five five dot zero, which means this is a class C. For those of you that know subnetting and IP addressing, that's a class C IP address. I've got the full class C to myself because that's a zero, it's not anything else. So class C means you've got three two five fives here. And uh, if I have to really, really try and summarize this for people that don't know subnetting and IP addressing, that basically just means in a nutshell that these three octets in the front need to be the same for everybody on this network. If they don't have the same three octets in the front, as you can see here, they're both the same, they will basically not be on the same network or the same division of the network. And if you go and change that zero now to something else like a 128 or a 192 or a 224, I'm not making those numbers up, they're actually set in stone, that will basically just subdivide that network. So full class C has about 256 IP addresses available, of which 254 are usable. You cannot use the first one, you cannot use the last one. They're reserved for things like broadcast address and network address. So keeping that in mind, you've got about 254 IP addresses. And if I go and make that zero a 128, that's going to go and divide that network of one, uh, 256 into two. So it's going to be two networks of 128 respectively and so on and so forth. So more on that later once we actually get to IP addressing and subnetting. I'm going to go ahead and click on next for now. Exclusions. So in that range of mine, if you go back here, you'll see we're going to be dishing out from 20 all the way to 70. Now from 20 all the way to 70, is there any IP address in that range that I would like to exclude? So at the moment we've got 50 IP addresses and I'm going to be dishing out all 50 of them randomly to devices that's going to be connected to my network. So if any phone, any tablet, any desktop, laptop, or whatever device needs an IP, they're going to get something randomly between 20 and 70 at this point in time. All 50 of them are available. If I go here, I have the ability to go and exclude one of those IPs for whatever reason. So I can go and say 192.168.0. And if I, for argument's sake, want to exclude 25, which falls in the, within that range, I can do so. This can be for any amount of reasons. You obviously have your own reasons. It could be because I want to go and statically assign that to a printer or a server or a something. If it's, the, if it's just one IP, you simply just go and type it twice like so. And there we go simply just type it twice. If it's a range of IPs, let's say I want to go and exclude all the way from 30 to 35, then it gets easy. 
you just go and do it like so. Repeat, 192 and 680, and then all the way to 35. You'll see it looks slightly different. It becomes tricky though if you need to exclude, let's say, five IPs, but they don't follow back to back on one another. Then you're gonna have to go and do them one by one, which is a bit tedious. I'm gonna leave it like that for now. Let's click on next. Lease. This is very much the same as leasing an apartment or a house or a something. Generally, once that contract or that agreement comes to an end, you either need to renew the lease or you need to pack up your stuff and get. You need to go. So it's very much the same of these IP addresses. You can see the default period on server 2019 is still the same as 2016 and still the same as server 2012 part two. It's eight days. Now the average organization I've worked with does not leave it on eight days. That's a security vulnerability and many other things. So the average company would make that about one day. In other words, 24 hours. So I'm gonna make that about one day. Now what's gonna happen here in a nutshell is, and I think you guys have an idea already if you've been following my series, if that lease expires, that IP address ceases to work. So if someone has obtained an IP address from our DHCP here right now, and they, let's say, leave their machine on during the night, they do not turn it off. That IP does not get released, as we've said in the previous video. It doesn't get released, and if it does not get released, it does not get renewed. So that IP is gonna expire, and after about 24 hours, that person's gonna open a browser or something, they're gonna try and browse the internet, and it's not gonna work. So to avoid it from happening, they need to renew that IP address. It can be done in multiple ways. One way is for them to restart the machine, or just turn it off and turn it back on again, that releases the old IP and requests a new one from the DHCP, like we've explained in the previous video. Alternatively, you can go to command prompt and type in the IP config release, or slash release, and then IP config slash renew command. This is all manually request and renew the command for you. I'll put that obviously on the screen for you guys so you can see it. So I'm gonna go here to next for now. Uh, no, I'll configure this later, that's fine for now. Let's just say next, finish. So we're almost up and running, almost. It's gonna drag this a little bit more to the right. So you can see there is our scope. You could actually have more than one, hypothetically speaking. Most companies I've dealt with only have one, but it is possible, especially in larger enterprise organizations to have more than one scope for various reasons. You'll notice here there's a little white circle with a little red arrow pointing downwards. That means that scope has not been activated yet. So that used to be a question in the exams, but as you know probably by now, WS011 does not have an exam associated to it. So if this was an exam, that would probably be a question in the exam. They would ask you what does that mean or what should the user do to get that scope to work. And to get it to work, one of the things you need to go and do is you need to go and activate that. You can think of it as a, a safety switch on a gun. The gun is not gonna fire until you take the safety switch off, and that's kind of like what it is. So while it's in this mode, you can go and test things and check things and configure things without, without it being live and actually dishing on IPs. So we've shown you guys how to go and make a scope and we've shown you guys how to do an exclusion. You can always go and add additional exclusions or reservations. You'll see there's a reservation folder here. So if I go to address pools, there you'll see my pool. You can see there's only the one from 20 to 70. You can see my current exclusions. And if I would like to add more exclusions here, because that always happens, this might be an existing environment that's been here for about five years. And today is the day where I need to go and add a new exclusion for some, some sort of new printer or something. And this can be done by either right-clicking here. That's the one I'm gonna show you right now. New exclusion. And you simply just type the IP twice. That's that. It's as easy as that, gents. So I'm going to close that up. Reservation. Let's go to that sucker. Reservation is going to show you which IPs have been reserved. So these IPs, unlike the excluded IPs, these ones will, in fact, be dished out to devices. The catch is these IPs that you're going to have here will always be dished out to the same device over and over. So if you've got some sort of device, let's say it's a printer of a dynamic IP address, that printer obviously needs to have the same IP. Otherwise, today I'm going to install it. I'm going to print through that printer and there's no problem. Tomorrow, that printer's IP address is going to change and I'm going to try and print and my PC is going to print towards the old IP address. That's a bit of a pickle. So to avoid that from happening, you want that printer or whatever this device is to always have the same IP. And this can be done by going to reservations I'm right-clicking there, new reservation, 
You give it a name, it quite frankly doesn't matter, but it, it does pay to give it a user-friendly name to help you and fellow colleagues identify the purpose of this reservation. So if it's a printer, well, go and call it printer. At least the next time you come here or any other fellow technician comes here, they'll know, oh, okay, that's for a printer. Then if this is a very large company, you might also want to mention which one. So I'm going to say this is maybe in reception. All right, now we know it's a printer and it's the one in reception. Which IP are we reserving? So as you know, our scope goes from 20 all the way to 70. Some of them have already been reserved. So let's say 41 is the one that we're going to allocate to the printer. So every day, over and over and over, the printer is going to get that same IP. Now you need the printer's MAC address. How you get that MAC address is completely up to you. There's like a million ways to do it. You can physically walk to the printer and you can go and check on it. There's normally some form of LCD display these days. Sometimes they're in black and white. Sometimes they're in color display. I can't tell you where because it depends on the make and the model and all that. But generally, it should be somewhere within the system settings or network settings and you'll find that. Alternatively, there's a lot of network softwares you get these days. You know, you can go and use NetScan or Advanced IP Scanner and there's many other ones I can go and mention that will allow you to scan your network and check what the MAC address is of that printer without having to physically walk to it. These are freewares and they're not illegal. That's what technicians actually go and use, you know, to help them make their lives a little bit easier. So you get that MAC address, you type in IP, you go and add it, and it's going to dish out that same IP to that same device every day over and over. All right, guys, I think we've pretty much concluded it. The only thing that's left to do here is for me to basically go ahead and activate that son of a gun. I'm not going to do that right now. I'm not actually active here on the internet, as you guys can see. Don't want to do that right now. But that's essentially all you need to go and do. Use this with caution though, because if you have an existing DHCP in your environment and you're going to go and activate, let's say, a pretend, pretend, play around, fool around DHCP of yours, then you could very well break your environment. I wouldn't say you're going to break it on day one because most of the devices on your company or your network will already have an IP from the real DHCP. It's more an issue from day two, especially this machine of yours is still going to be running on day two. Because on day two, those machines are going to request an IP from a DHCP and your DHCP being one of two on the network is going to reply to that request for an IP and it's going to dish out an IP to them, which is an invalid IP. And then nothing's going to work and you're going to wonder what the cheese is going on. All right, guys, I hope this video has been informative. If it has been, you should know by now, you know what to do. Smash that like button. If you're new to my channel or this series, maybe consider subscribing with the notification bell. Otherwise, you're not going to know uh, when I release a new episode for this series or any other one for that matter. And if there's anything specific you'd like me to cover or if you've got any questions, by all means, drop a comment down below and I'll gladly assist you with your issue and see if I can help you. All right, guys, I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye, guys.